Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast, presented by Canon Press. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 201. 201. What we're dealing with in our current crisis, our current cultural crisis, is what it looks like when the establishment loses the conservatives. What it looks like when the establishment loses the conservatives. Radicals always want to tear down, and, and either they believe they can cook up something better, build something better, or they want to tear down and they have an arbitrary, capricious faith that something better will simply mysteriously or magically rise up out of the ashes. And conservatives are the ones who say, no, no, we prefer the devil we know to the devil we don't know. And so what, what has happened is we have uh, gone through a period of time where the establishment, the, the, the people that conservatives instinctively rally to and defend and say things like, yes, but that was bad, but we couldn't get along without it. We, we need stability. We need order. We need law and order. Uh, we have uh, conservatives are the people who would reflexively defend the cops. You know, th- so when there's a police shooting uh, and people start forming up, you know, to take sides in the political battle that will follow after this police shooting. Just if the victim was a black guy, many black Americans will be instinctively rallying to the victim's side, the dead person's side, before they know anything about what is going on. But the same thing has to be said about the conservatives who rally to the police's side, right? Before they know anything. This is why we have trials. This is why we want to find out the facts before we make a judgment, before we convict anybody of anything. So the, what's happened over the course of, I would say, since the election of Donald Trump in 2016, which sent shockwaves through the entire establishment, and there was, a non, there was an unrelenting, nonstop effort to discredit his presidency, uh, accusing him of uh, colluding with the Russians, that he, uh, he had a deal with the Russians, he was a, <laughs> a, a Russian puppet or patsy. And the FBI ran with that story for months, a year, more, knowing that the evidence that it was based on was bogus. Now, what's happened is conservatives... Uh, um, Conservatives are, uh, I just saw a, uh, there was a, a chain of tweets that some gent, I've forgotten his name, uh, posted that I, th- I think was quite telling. And then I saw Tucker Carlson uh, repeating, uh, you know, repeating this guy's points. And I think it's very, very telling, very true. Uh, there are many conservatives that don't know, for example, they don't have smoking gun evidence that the election was rigged. But they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if it was rigged, the FBI and the press and the establishment would be lying to us about it. Right. So that's the thing they know. Now, and some people who have followed it closely think that there's there are reasons for thinking that there was voter fraud in Fulton County, Georgia, and Maricopa County, Arizona, and in Pennsylvania, and so on. But just leave leave aside for a moment the facts of the case. Let's Let's stipulate that, let's say there's an election audit, and there's one going on in Arizona now, and let's say the election audit shows or demonstrates that Biden won Maricopa County, and the margin of error, and it it was a clean win. Let's say it shows that. And let's say it shows that we do the same thing in Georgia and the same thing in Pennsylvania, and the same results. Biden won. The thing that has deeply unsettled the conservatives is not the idea that Biden could win a presidential election, although it is kind of staggering when you, <laughs> when you think about it. Because after all, Obama was elected president twice, and 
that was a legit straight up election. You know, so, so Obama won legitimately. Biden got, uh, excuse me, Obama got all those votes. So America is capable of shooting itself in the head like that. You know, so we've done it. We've done it multiple times before, and we can do it again. So it it could conceivably happen with uh, someone like Biden, but the behavior of the establishment between 2016 and 2020 demonstrated that if the election were fraudulent, and if CNN knew that, and if the Washington Post knew that, and if the New York Times knew that, and if MSNBC knew that, and if the FBI knew that, they would lie to us about it. That's the thing that has conservatives really rattled because they don't have anywhere for their reflexes to go, right? There's no flag, there's no flag and flagpole for them to rally around. Where do they go? They, you know, they go out into the, uh, we're going to have a big, demonstra- a dem- big demonstration in the streets, boys. <laughs> what, what is it? Business casual? All right. So continuing on with episode 201 in the podcast, we come to our hamartiology section. In this round, I'm going to take two related words together. Each one is a hopox. That is, it's only has, each one has only one use in the New Testament. And why I'm doing this, uh, doing it this way should become obvious in a minute. The word dolios means deceitful, and its one use is in 2 Corinthians. Dalios means deceitful. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, there you are, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.13. The word daliao, the verb, means to use deceit. So dalios, deceitful, and daliao means use deceit. Uh, Romans 3.13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. There it is. The poison of asps is under their lips. So the devil is the father of lie. Uh, the devil is the father of liars, and Christ is the truth. That is a significant watershed right there. Those false teachers who go out to do the devil's business are described as deceitful workers. They transform themselves to look like apostles of Christ, but they're nothing of the kind. So we make a grievous error when we think that the devil's main business is selling unrighteousness. That's just one of his side hustles, selling unrighteousness, hookers and cocaine and drinking too much. That's a side hustle. His main business is selling what he calls righteousness. When he lies, his central lie is about that. We too often forget that the devil is self-righteous. The devil is self-righteous. The devil is a Pharisee. And he is selling these lies to the general populace who are described in the Romans 3 passage. We are all bent to the telling of lies, and it is this way, uh, and it's this way for us from the womb. In order for any of that to change, there must be an intervention from God. The only reason the deceitful workers get as far as they do is because they are selling their wares to a deceitful public. As the saying goes, you can't cheat an honest man. All right, the book review um, uh, this time around for episode 201 in the podcast is a book, new book just out called Justifying Revolution by a guy named uh, Gary Stewart. Gary Stewart, Justifying Revolution. This is, uh, is published by Oxford University Press. If you look it up, it might be because it's, because it's OUP, it might be a tad pricey, but really think about getting it. It is really worth your while. So, how did the theologians and preachers of the American colonies justify the revolution against Great Britain? How is it justified? Now, one of the things that has happened in recent years is that historians, including evangelical historians, have said that that the American clergy in preaching the revolution, in defending the revolution, in uh, advocating for the revolution, were departing from their theological foundations. They were departing from their theological, ecclesiastical history and were veering off into this new thing. Uh, Stewart shows that that is not 
the case. It's not even close to being the case. So the argument goes, well, there were all these continental reformed guys who were pretty, pretty uh, conservative, and then the Americans seized on John Locke and his secular arguments for uh, liberty, and they, they reverse-engineered their theology to fit with John Locke or to fit with new Enlightenment currents. It would be fairer to say, this is a side note, this is not something Stuart gets into, but it'd be fairer to say that John Locke was actually secularizing pro- standard Protestant resistance theory theology, which began in the 1500s. So you have uh, Vindicii Contra Tyrannos, written by a Huguenot in the 1500s. You have uh, the work of Rutherford, uh, Lex Rex, in Scotland. You have Buchanan. Uh, you have other resistance theorists, and even even uh, even John Calvin in Book Four of the Institutes is um, argues for the right of the lesser magistrates to intervene to resist overweening tyranny. There were there were several centuries of Protestant resistance theory, and what Stewart shows is that the American clergymen who were supporting the revolution. Oh, I keep calling it the revolution. Let me say something about that word. Later, with the French Revolution, the uh, word revolution began to have some of the connotations that we now have for the Russian Revolution and so on, where you have a complete repudiation of what went before and, and so on. At the time for the American War for Independence, which is a better name for it, revolution simply meant a turnover in government. So there was, uh, there was the American Revolution in... Um, in 1776. And in England, in 1688, they had what they called the Glorious Revolution or the Bloodless Revolution. So the thing that people don't get is that the French Revolution in the 1790s and the American Revolution in in the 1770s were two completely different kinds of critter. They were two completely different things. The Americans were the conservatives fighting for the rights of Englishmen. And the French revolutionaries wanted to bulldoze everything and start over from scratch. So the French revolutionaries were the revolutionaries in our modern sense of the word. The American revolutionaries were conservatives. The men who went to war under the various colonies were fighting under the government uh, that their grandfathers had grown up under. They were not trying to overthrow anything. They were trying to establish a um, independence from the crown, but they weren't trying to overthrow uh, the existing order at all. Now, what um, there are a number of really fascinating things that Stewart points out in his uh, book. I've said for years, I'd, I'd read somewhere, and, and I, I've said for years that the single biggest controversy uh, in the in the colonies before the war was whether the king was going to appoint an archbishop over the colonies. And, um, and, uh, and Stewart gets into this. He, he gets into that controversy in good detail. And the Americans didn't have a problem with the Anglicans over here or the Episcopalians having their own bishop as a, or, or their own archbishop as a clergyman. But in England, in the Church of England, an archbishop had certain legal prerogatives. And if a, uh, an archbishop were established over here, the Americans didn't see how there was any way to keep him from having those legal prerogatives over here, which they did not want an ecclesiastical, an ecclesiastical person, uh, office holder, to have. So there's a whole section on that. The, even, the evangelical clergymen in England were widely supportive of the Americans in the American War for Independence, which is interesting. When the Stamp Act was repealed, so when uh, the Stamp Act was applied, the Americans revolted, quit buying goods and services, and there was a showdown, and finally uh, Parliament backed down and repealed the Stamp Act. When they repealed the Stamp Act, the church bells in London rang all day in celebration. The church bells of London rang all day in celebration of the fact that the Americans had won that particular showdown. That is interesting. This book is well-written, well-researched, well-documented. 
it really is a fine work of scholarship, but it's not, don't let the word scholarship put you off. It is uh, accessible, straightforward. It's just, uh, I, I would encourage you to get this book, Justifying Revolution by Gary Stewart. If you enjoyed this week's episode, check out Doug's book, Empires of Dirt, Secularism, Radical Islam, and the Mere Christendom Alternative at canapress.com. Yeah.